sorry if I spit when I speak. Today we're going to ask, is Mike Brown cheap? Is that at the heart of all of the Bengals' problems? Um, is that that you are a rhetorical question? I mean, that is a question. That conclusion? Well, because, you know, a lot of people have pointed out the Bengals are actually in the upper half of the NFL in spending in terms of the salary cap. Um, so, is this yeah, just... Yeah, my a, belly button is on the upper half of my body, but it still smells pretty bad. Um, yes. So, what we want to know is... Is it fair to say that the reason the Bengals are not capable of getting to the next level and that they keep making the same mistakes is that Mike Brown is cheap? Is that at the heart of all of this? So, the first matter is spending on players. Now, we know that the Bengals, they signed their own good players. This is something that Marvin Lewis affirmed the other day. Um, So, if they're drafting well and signing their own players, is it fair to say that they should be going out and getting free agents? Because you only have so much cap room. So I want to start with, I think, something that's fairly obvious. And that in, in the top of the free agent market in the NFL, the, main, the, the number that matters in terms of new deals for these second contracts, it's the guaranteed money. It's the, it's the money that actually matters in the contract. A lot of people will just look at the total money divided by the years and give like an average salary or whatever. The only number that matters in contracts is guaranteed money. And the Bengals are notorious for not giving out a lot of guaranteed money because the way that they structure a lot of their free agent contracts is that basically their guaranteed money is the total money. The, their negotiation in terms of getting players to join them is that you're going to see every penny of this contract um, through its entirety. So we're going to offer you little guaranteed money, you know, quotations around the word guaranteed, but you're going to see all this money and you might not see that with other, with, with other teams and whatnot. So that's, that, that is their entire negotiation tactic. But in terms of total money, they're going to see less than what they would get in other teams along with less, obviously total, uh, total guaranteed money and whatnot. And that is not attractive in terms of eyes of other players, and that doesn't attract a lot of high market free agent deals and free agent players on the market. And that all stems from Mike, who, who Mike Brown is as an owner and as a business owner as a bottom line guy, because he, at the source, is going to do whatever it takes to just generate a profit, basically, at the end of the day. And that doesn't mean that that, that doesn't that doesn't mean bringing in resetting the market at the free agent line. It just means getting guys that are, you know, familiar with the system and won't cost a lot in terms of, you know, total guaranteed money and whatnot. That's right, and they won't spend on things that uh, you know don't show up in the salary cap, like indoor facilities, player amenities. Who would want to be on such a team? Uh, I mean, the only plus it seems to be for the players and why they want to be here is maybe because. The Bengals are usually loath to let people go. So you got the job security there. But, you know, why is there job security? Well, we're, well, going, to, we're going to get to the uh, other uh, matters. Right now, we just talk about the players right now. And they sign the players. Yes, they give them less guaranteed money. But like you said, in the reality, they know they're going to get that money. But free agents don't want to sign because they don't necessarily know how they operate. Or maybe the Bengals aren't as merciful toward their uh toward other people, you know, players that other teams drafted as their own, so it's not as attractive. But the question is, I mean, look, because look, Green Bay has gone very far without really bringing in expensive free agents. The one time they did in recent memory, you know, Martellus Bennett, it just didn't work out for them, you know. So, I mean, some teams operate like that. You know, the Bengals are a, are a small market team, you know, the Packers are a, a small market team. Uh, and this is this is just a business model. It's more of like yeah, but look, the personnel decisions of the Bengals. Okay, when you lose a year of your life, okay, when a year of your life disappears, let's say you spent a year of your life, I don't know, you know, in you doing something you hated, or you spent a year of your life and it's totally a waste of that year, you would regret that. Okay, so what happened to this year? This was a waste in the year of the li- in the life of the Bengals. A wasted year in the life of the Bengals. What happened this year? It was a very simple personnel decision that led to uh, the year that we saw, and that was Whitworth Zeitler. It was very simple. Okay, we could. I get. We could live without Sanu. Okay, I get that we could live without Marvin Jones. But you can't live. You can't function without a, without an offensive line. 
And that was a personnel decision that was directly resulting from the way the Bengals do their personnel. They just aren't willing to. And so they threw away a whole year. Well, you know, okay. yeah, one thing I would say is that, so the Bengals, they're my, and John, correct me if I'm wrong, their approach towards re-signing their own players. Now, Marvin, Marvin Lewis said they sign, they, they make a great effort to sign all of their good players. Now, in the case of Whitford and Zeitler, that's not true. In the case of Zeitler, they didn't make any effort. Nothing. Now, now, uh, my understanding of it is that <clears throat> the Bengals, they want to sign their own players so long as they think they're getting, you know, a, a good deal. They're assigning them at market value. So, for instance, Drake Patrick, people were doubting, should they even re-sign him? And they give him $10 million a year. That's a lot of money. But for a corner, that's a good deal. For an, a starting veteran corner, that's a good deal. You know, uh, they gave Sean Williams a contract before he had really been a full-time a starter because they, they anticipated him being a starter. And what they had seen, they said, okay, he's going to be a starting safety. If we get him for like 4 or $5 million a year, that's a great deal. And so they gave him the money, right? Um, but with a 35-year-old tackle or, a, you know, a, a guard, giving them that kind of money, they're like, yes, they are actually better players than Drake Kirkpatrick and maybe Sean Williams, but it's not a good deal. And that's a mentality, and that is, you know, something I think that dictates a lot. If they're looking for guys that are in the 26-year-old, you know, range of age, and also they play premier positions like corner, you know, pass rusher, uh, in the case of A.J. Green, you know, that's another thing. So the Bengals, they do have a, a relatively, they do spend a good amount of money, but we have to know that they also have some of the greatest players in franchise history currently on the roster because of good drafting. So, for instance, AJ Green getting fifty million dollars a year. What are they gonna do? Not to resign AJ Green? There wasn't an option, right? Geno Atkins, one of the best pass rushers. Carlos Dunlap, the best pass. You know, these are the best. So, two of the best pass rushers in Bengals history. What are they gonna do? Not sign them? Andy Dalton, franchise quarterback. He's on a bargain deal. So you put those guys together. That's you know what is that, John? Like a third of their salary cap right there. Those just those four, and they're such great. You know, players at the Bengals, it kind of forced their hand. You can't just let them walk. And they didn't pay them more than other guys would. So in that I'm sense... Only... Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, so I'm saying, so in that sense, it wasn't, you know, it's, it's it's now you look at the roster and they say, oh, they're spending this much money. But it, they, they didn't have an option because they have such good players. That's what I'm saying. So it's different than back when the, in the 90s when they were really cheap because they had no good players. Yeah, yeah, and like Clint, Clint Bowling, like go, kind of goes along with like the guy like Sean Williams as as like the perfect Bengal re-signing. He Clint Bowling was a fourth round pick, started every game at right guard first year, and then started every game at left guard for the next three years. He played out of his entire four year contract as a fourth rounder, mind you. So he's making less than a million dollars a year at the time. So for him, Clint. An, an, a pay raise for Clint Bowling was in where he's getting paid now, about the $5 million range, which is well below what guards are getting paid now. In terms of Kevin Zeidler, Kevin Zeidler, the last year of his contract, was on the fifth-year option, so he was getting about 8 to 10 I think he was somewhere in eight to, 8 to $10 million range. So they weren't going to possibly get at him on a deal anywhere like lower than that, which is where they're paying Clint Bowling. He was going to reset the market at guard, and they don't like to do that with almost any position other than like the premium positions like a cornerback, a pass rusher, or a quarterback. And A.J. Green got, at the time, in terms of total money, a market value deal. But in terms of guaranteed money, going back to this, he got significantly lower than what Demarius Thomas got, what Des Bryant got, what Julio Jones got at the time. Andy Dahl, when he signed his contract, he signed it with one year left on his rookie deal, and he was a second rounder, so he wasn't getting a lot of money compared to other first-round quarterbacks. And his deal, like you said, it, the value of his deal in terms of where other starters at the position it's still great. I think he's only like the 22nd or 23rd highest paid quarterback in terms of total money. And the guaranteed money is low because they incentivize getting every single dollar on that contract. And that's that's how they operate with all of the players that they like to bring back. That's where they get that status quo. We spend as, just as much as any other team, but they don't actually spend it. Some and most, But most of it and some of it, a good portion of it should be spent more wisely. So in other words, the point is that salary cap is different from the actual money being spent on players. And the Bengals, their salary cap is, is, is they never go, you know, they never have dead money, basically. Basically no dead money. Um, no. T t p people who look at the salary cap should honestly start looking at just 
guaranteed money because I guarantee you the Bengals, I don't know the number, but I guarantee you the Bengals are in the bottom quarter of the league in terms of guaranteed money in contracts right now. I mean, look, the way they operate their business, it would be great for like a mom and pops, like kids uh, clothing store or something in the sense that, you know, all the numbers add up, you know, you know whatever. But when you talk about a business, you know, a multi-billion dollar business that you have millions of fans and we're going to get to this, but, you know, they built in a stadium. They want to see results. They want you to grow. They don't want you to just survive like the mom and pops. No. Um, but actually, the mom yeah. and pops the mom and pops is actually who they are in terms of the, their family-run organization. Yeah, who do you they, yeah. they are. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm with you guys on everything you're describing with the way the Bengals are managing things. There are big, big issues. A good team... A good team is like a, like a good hedge fund, okay? You you put money in, and the hedge fund, they make the investments, they get the, the, the dollar moving, they get the shake and bake, they do all that, and, and, and you get a lot of money out of it. But the Bengals are like a sperm bank. You keep making deposits, you're never going to make a withdrawal. They're cheap. They ne- you're never, it's never going to end up with a winning season because of the way that they're managing their money. And the well, way one they're day they're going to produce a beautiful baby. I'm really, I'm waiting for that day. No, it's one thing. You, you, when you deposit in the sprint bank, you never make a withdrawal. You just keep depositing, and that's what that's what. I think you're doing it wrong, Hoji. But I don't. I don't want to get caught on the analogy. I want to move along, and I want to talk about spending on non-players uh, within the organization. So coaches, scouts, general manager, and so forth. And back in 2011, Rick Riley wrote an article because I don't know where we can find the exact info on this. But he was saying how. Uh, the Bengals make uh, four people do the work of eight. Most teams have four or five scouts. The Bengals keep one or two. And he also told a story about how, you know, um, they don't really have uh, files on their players. They just, you know, rely on, like, newspapers and things like that. And I remember um, Joe Goodberry recently on the podcast was talking about how all the teams in the NFL, they have grades on every single player in the NFL. Because they have not just uh, a scouts for the college, but they have people who are keeping track of what players look like in the NFL. And if somebody is cut, who they can pick up right away. Like, oh, he'd fit with our team. Let's get him. The Bengals, if you notice, they pick up former Bengals like Pat Sims, like Michael Johnson, these type of guys, because they don't put in the time or money to investigate other players around the league, which is important, right? It's important in depth. And sometimes you pick up key starters just, you know, on the waiver wire. So, uh, John, I want you to talk about those. I think in terms of keeping track of current free or current NFL players who might hit the market, I think Duke does a good job of keeping tabs on players that he liked in the draft process that they actually that they ended up not getting. I think if you look back at some of the unrestricted free agents that the Bengals have signed in the last few years, some of the things that will come up in like the press conference, whether it's Marvin or Duke talking about it, it's, it's, it always comes up as, as we love this guy coming out of college. We love this guy um, in the draft, and we just didn't get the opportunity to, to take him. So I definitely think that players that they ha- had graded highly coming out of college, that is obviously a factor that comes with signing guys or picking up guys in emergency situations, whether they be undrafted or late-round guys. Uh, Kevin Minter was a guy that they loved coming out of LSU back in 2013. They just didn't end up drafting him. Um, but, yeah, I definitely think that in terms of, you know, just general player scouting and player personnel, Duke Tobin does a good job, and it's definitely better than where they were in the early 2000s. But I, re- I remember watching, like, uh, Arizona Cardinals All or Nothing on, on, on Amazon. It was, like, the season-long in-depth uh, private access, whatever. It was, like, on Amazon a couple years ago. And when they were signing free agents, you know, during the middle of the season, they had, you know, plenty of guys going going through, like, thousands and thousands of players in the NFL and have detailed reports on, on all of them and t- determining which, which player would be best to come in. And I definitely think that most teams, like the, like the Cardinals, are ahead of the Bengals in this um, situation. And, but yeah, and, and but the Bengals still do a decent job of that, but it's just more of what they had thought of them, like coming out of the draft, rather than keeping tabs up on, on them in the current day. I, yeah, I realize this is only tangentially related to what we're talking about here, but I would love to know what the process was in scouting, hiring, decision-making when it came to John Ross. Because I, I feel like if, you know, you have something called a case study. It's like, if the, we, if we I think John Ross would be a great case study to under, understanding what's wrong with Bengals management? Why was he brought in? 
if he was going to be used the way he's been used. I, well, think about the it value. Like, if he's the fastest player ever, that yeah. yeah, is more valuable than other players. I mean, yeah, I guess. Like, if if you want to make a doll of him, you know, like, and have a big slogan on top of the packaging of the doll, fastest player ever. But if you're not going to play with that doll, if you're not going to have the, the guy Wait, run on the Let's field, be honest. Marvin Lewis, uh, apparently, you know, you see the picture of him when Ross was drafted. He was very unhappy. Also, do yeah. you remember Do you remember Ross wanted to, like, race a horse or something? And he said, it's not a circus. You know, he was upset. Ex- he doesn't, John, uh, Marvin Lewis is not in numbers. You know, this guy's the fastest. This guy's the this. He wants football players. He wants guys, but, like, I think. And, and, I, and I actually respect that. Yeah. I, I yeah, can see, yeah. I can, I, I'm one of the few people, I'm one of the people who totally understands why Marvin Lewis was not crazy about Ross. Well, but let's I be clear. But, every, but, you know, people have pointed out, John Ross is a very, you know, he does have a wider array of, of, you know, kind of routes he can run. He's not Maybe just he clumsy, a speed. But, look, yeah. but this is my question. I, what happened? Like, how does the Bengal, how does it work? It was a power struggle. As Marvin's tenure has increased and as Duke Tobin's tenure has increased, Duke Tobin has slowly been getting, been basically taking away more power in terms of roster building from Marvin Lewis while Mike Brown has kept his share. Duke, John Ross was a Duke Tobin and Mike Brown pick. It wasn't a Marvin Lewis pick at all. And that was kind of the rumors from the building at the time. And then there was a report that Marvin, like, didn't want Ross at all. He wanted Ruben Foster there, and Mike Brown wanted um wanted, wanted Ross. And obviously, Tobin was really high on Ross before the draft. There were reports that he was that he was infatuated with Ross. He compared him to Marvin Harrison, all that all that kind of stuff. And T- Tobin is the de facto GM. He doesn't have the title, but he he does the work that a GM would do just without the salary. So I definitely think that Ross, in terms of a case study, would be a great example in terms of the power struggle that is in. That is in Paul Brown Stadium now, and it's something that maybe Marvin negotiated for when he was brought back. They cutting him? him? No, it, it, he he would he would be he would be gaining some of that power that he might have lost. Oh, I see. I see. we're not like we're not going to do any more of this John Ross stuff kind of thing. All right. So, so look. Uh, so um, okay, just moving along here. Back to the main topic. So it is about spending on the GM now. John, you said that Duke is basically the GM. Now, uh, for a long time, of course, Mike Brown was taking a salary of $1 million for himself, basically, because he was acting like the GM. Um, but it, it seems that that has changed in the recent years. And, you know, I don't know if they're paying Duke Tobin like a GM or if it's just about the title that he doesn't like a non family member having the title. Uh, but at any rate, yeah, yeah, things do seem to be getting better in terms of having, you know, real ma- management. But the you have pointed out that our uh, struggles at offensive line and drafting bad offensive line has to it goes back to the scouting. Yeah, and I think um, part of the Bengals PR in terms of how the, how they run things is that their view, their take on ha- only having four like regional scouts in their entire scouting department, their take on that is that they take pride in having a lot of power and a lot of um, pull in terms of the war room, in terms of drafting guys, in terms of, you know, making the case for guys. Some, some teams like the Browns, they have like, you know, dozens of scouts and like all, all these different voices coming from different directions. And they take pride in having, you know, only a few voices um, you know, make cases for players and whatnot. But at the same time, you have guys like Paul Alexander or, you know, maybe a Jay Hayes, a defensive line, who are doing a lot of the scouting work as well. And some of those guys, and some some position coaches, are naturally better coaches than they are player evaluators, especially for college players. Paul Alexander was not a great guy in terms of evaluating talent coming out of college. But when you give him a guy like a Willie Anderson or a Rich Bram or an Eric Steinbach or a Bobby Williams or just, just any guy who's, you know, has the ability to be molded into a good offensive lineman. Paul Alexander was the guy to do that, but he wasn't the guy to, to look at a college offensive lineman and say, "That's my guy. I'm gonna I'm gonna go coach him." No, he would look at raw he would look at raw traits and stuff that wasn't that wasn't translatable into the pro game and whatnot. And he it it, it it was just it was just a dynamic of having the wrong guys having the wrong eyes look at look at draft talent, and that's where a lot of the bust came from. And you you can you can definitely attribute that to a smaller scouting department, but it's also just having the wrong eyes looking at it well the wrong eyes but also john i mean even if you have the, the you're you have talent in terms of a scouting it's it's a very time consuming thing like these guys lead miserable lives from what i understand they're always on the road with their binoculars right they're sleeping in the motel six 
right? They're eating the gross breakfast. Yeah. That's part of the a scouting life. You don't, you, you know, a coach, at least let's say half the year, he is, you know, just constantly working with players and practice and all that, right? So yeah. that does, it just doesn't make sense. You can have the most brilliant mind in the world. He's not going to be able to. I, but, but, but this goes back to the Rick Riley crew. They have four guys doing the jobs of, of eight guys. And, 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 and Mike Brown thinks that, okay, I can just have my, have my position coaches scout their positions in college, and I can get away with that. And we've seen the shortcomings of that. Yeah, you know, and um, another thing that, you know, Marvin Lewis, one of the indoor training facilities. So now we're moving on to the amenities and the other, uh, you know, necessary things for a team. Because you remember, they hear this is a first class organization. This is what they are. There's a famous story when Jonathan Joseph went to the Texans. He's like, yeah, this is a first class organization. They give us Gatorade and deodorant and soap. And we don't have to have a roommate when we go on road trips, you know, unlike Cincinnati, right? So, you know, when when players go to certain organizations, when that team has money, you know, because cause the Bengals, the Browns, their money is from football. So uh, the Crafts, they make the cheese, right, John? I mean, I think they make yeah, cheese. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, uh, you know, the, the Seahawks guy, Paul Allen, he makes the computer, right? That's right. You, yep. you have Very the, wealthy man. Yeah, cheese, computer, these are things I use every day. You know, right. Brown, he makes what? The color brown. He, that, that's the product of football field he's been putting on the, out there. <laughs> yeah. But, but the, 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 yeah, so, so he, you know, doesn't have the indoor, you know, Marvel Lewis wanted it. Mar- Mike Brown said, yeah, I like the idea, but I'm not as keen on it as he is. In other words, I'm not going to pay for it. You know, I got the people of Hamilton County to pay a billion dollars for a stadium. And by the way, that the stadium is still eating up like, you know, over 15 percent of their county budget and other areas like, you know, people are starving. Right. Kids don't have a school. You have other necessary funding uh, that is not uh, happening there because of, you know, what is it? It says the child services, juvenile justice. These things were a slash sheriff's department. These things were all a slash to pay for this stadium. Yeah. And, uh, you know, John. People know. Yeah. There's, yeah. I mean, yeah. There's, a, there's this article here um, that uh, that says that, you know, it's widely recognized. This is talking about Dashiell Bennett's article that's widely recognized that, that uh, you know, it's one of the worst kinds of investments for, for public in fi- public financing for the, the, the city or, or to invest in these stadiums, right? So... It, 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 and the Bengals, and, and yeah, and Wall Street Journal said that the Bengals that was the worst of all the bad deals for uh, cities. The Bengals right. was was the absolute worst. And now, John, what is the situation with the lease? He's going to try to you know get that out of the people too, right? Yeah, I mean, he's going to do what any owner would do in the situation. He's going to leverage the city to move, and if and if they don't end up paying for it, then he's going to use that leverage against them, which is probably why the Hamilton County is going to probably cave in again because they don't want to lose the team but mike brown in general if you know if it's not necessary to quote unquote win he's not going to dip into his own personal pocket to pay it for because once again he's a bottom line guy he would be a great owner of like some private pastry company but you know an nfl franchise is not like any other private or franchise you know it, 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 it requires going that extra effort but mike brown feels that he doesn't have the capital to do that and honestly honestly i think Mike, Mike Brown has kept Marvin Lewis here. One of the one of the main reasons why he's kept him here so long is because going back to that Jonathan Joseph thing, it, it is true that the Bengals don't have are not an attractive franchise for for players who don't know the who don't know the organization who are, are from the outside because you know they don't have all these extra amenities they don't have a training facility they have to borrow UCs whenever you know UC allows them to and the, you know their facilities in general are behind most of the league but i think they've kept Marvin Lewis so long is because he has a great he's a he's a players coach and he and he you know creates these great relationships with these players and that's why the players want to play for him and come back for him and that is that is that is the pull for players to play for the Bengals it's not it's not to play for and, and they might just finish out their contracts players. even if they don't perform they're going to get to play over some young exactly. guy or rookie right but, yeah. and yeah. and you got the you got the job security and and if you're a defensive player i still think you're going to develop under Marvin. I, I do think that you're going to develop under Marvin and i know that's a draw and and i wonder and I know this is a conspiracy theory, but I wonder if Mike Brown isn't like, look, if I bring Marvin back and we keep 
not doing so great. Everyone's going to blame Marvin, not me. I think he's got this relationship with Marvin that he's kind of happy with, which is that the focus is on Marvin Lewis, and people are not really talking about the big problem, which is Mike Brown. The big problem is not Marvin Lewis, but I think I think Mike Brown likes where he is with the Bengals, which is people kind of think they're going to win. They're kind of getting like, you know, they're getting at least five wins a year. And when it doesn't work out, work out well, well, they blame, they blame uh, Marvin. Mar- marginally competitive, which is, I guess, an appropriate um, classification of what the Bengals are nowadays, is much better than what Mike Brown, than what the Bengals were when Mike Brown first took over. Mike Brown has been lulled in, into complacency because his first 10 years as the owner of the Bengals was an absolute failure and he's completely fine with it i've i've met mike once i've i've had the ple- i have i've had the pleasure of talking to him once and it i just had the pleasure bo- of talking to you hey hey. hey i i truly believe i truly believe and i'm not just saying this i truly believe that in his mind he loves what he does and he in in, in his mind in his way of doing things he how much he, did they I, offer I, you I'm, how much did they hey, offer I'm, you? I, I, I'm i'm honestly, honestly saying what what I felt from listening to him talk. I feel I, I definitely believe in my heart that he's loved what he's what he, what he does, and he doesn't just look at this as a paycheck or anything close to like that. You know, he was he was raised by Paul. You know, everything he learned was from Paul. He's just failed to evolve in the sense of where Paul would have. But I truly believe that he loves being the owner of the Bengals, and he loves being with the players. He loves being in the facility. He loves what he does. He just doesn't really do it well, and I don't blame. I don't. I, I don't think there was any bad faith in any of his decision making. It's just the way he does things just doesn't work, and well, no one's had the courage to tell him that. Like a conversation. I mean, you guys talked and 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 got to know each other. I I I, I had a five minute con. I've had a five minute conversation with him, and it honestly, I I I, I didn't I didn't see an evil man in him. I saw. I, I, just, I just saw a man who liked what he did. He's not and even, what, and what, you know, John, go on. Wait, wait, yeah. wait, hold on. What does he think of our show? Oh, oh, he hates the show, obviously. But, well, you know. did you tell him how much it costs to produce? Oh, tell him, man. tell him how much it costs. It's, 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 bad, it's bad publicity. It's the I cheapest know. show on I YouTube. Mean, yeah. you, the reason I ask is because Daddy's approach to making shows is so much like... <laughs> Mike Brown's approach to running football. I mean, the man, Daddy, who spends zero money, I have gotten paid nothing for years. Well, I, I keep well getting, we're, re- we're getting closer to the puppy. We kind of I have keep, a, a yeah, we're at a standstill yeah. for the puppets, but we were going strong for a while. Yeah, the puppet, you saw the puppet thing. Instead of paying for my puppet, he tried to raise the money and it didn't work out. So I don't get even. Get look, the look, okay, so going back, to, going back to Mike Brown, John, you should make a good point. I read an article saying that he loves the city of Cincinnati, he wants to win there. And another thing is he loves the football team. He's around the team at least 360 days of the year. All of these things, the fact that he loves it, the tradition, all of that, it makes it seem like, you know, the people of, of Hamilton County should realize. He's all he's bluffing. He's never going to leave Cincinnati. I mean, Wait. you know, he's think like about royal, he's like the royal family of the Browns yeah, are like and, the royal family. Yeah, I mean, no other no other city would stand for that. And he's eighty something years old. You know, he's probably like you know one hundred fifty pounds overweight. You, you know how you know, long it yeah. take him to get to another city on that go kart? That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. <laughs> it's taken like months. I don't see no, him I moving. Know. I don't see him moving. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't see it either. I, I like. I, he is cheap. He, he is cheap. He's, a, he's a frugal man. He's a frugal business owner. He, 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 he report, really John, is. But when Mike Brown farts. I, there's a report out there. When Mike Brown farts, only dogs can hear it because he's so tight. I don't. I haven't heard this report. <laughs> there was a report. There was a report. I don't. Okay. Yeah, the, the 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 one day this guy was walking down the street minding his own business. He sees he sees Mike Brown with just one shoe, and he says. Hey, that's Mike Brown, Mr. Brown. Did you lose a shoe? And he said, No, I actually just found one. Yeah, I don't think I don't think these are from reliable sources. Do you remember what you talked about? Internet. Remember what you talked about getting from reliable? Yeah, I think those were jokes on the message board. But um, look, Mike Brown. This we're gonna close pretty soon. But look, um, Mike Brown. He comes from an older uh, a school of thought where, you know, the NFL was a small and he actually, there are reports that he is against the NFL growing in terms of revenue because then the salary cap raises and other owners that have money, the cheese guys, the computer guys, like, great, we can spend more on our team. We have more liberty. He's like, oh, no, I have to spend more on my team. So they say he's actually against the progression of the NFL, of it growing 
because uh, of how limited he is in well, finances. So yeah, but look at it. Look at it another way. I mean, there are other organizations. I mean, not all the organizations are going to be able to spend equally, right? So, you know, there is a point where to make one of the beautiful things that's happened, I think, in the in the past 10, 15 years is that uh, there's been more parity among these teams. And I mean, you could risk that, you know, if, if things change. It was a time when there were just teams that were, I mean, now it's the Browns, and the, you know, the Browns are pretty bad all the time. But there was, I feel like, this is anecdotally, when I started watching football many, many decades ago, there was, it's it just always the same teams, you know. But it's been, it's been spread around more, and I hope it stays yeah. that way. I mean, look, the Jaguars, look, the Jaguars went to the uh, AFC Championship game, their second year of existence. So did the, the Carolina Panthers. The Jaguars were bad for a while, then they get a rich owner who makes, like, auto parts, Shad Khan. And yeah. now they're back guy. to they won a playoff game, you know. Yeah. You know. So I mean, I think money is the key. You know, I think that's really, uh, really important. And by the way, Mike Brown is a all you know by all accounts he's a good guy. There are rumors that he might be secretly very generous, and that's why he maybe that's why he doesn't like to spend on others. He wants to help people. You know, they say some of the local high schools maybe he like helps them out or. Something we don't know. There's no actual documentation of him, you know, because I looked I, it up. And I, and Marvin Lewis has a charity fund. Andy Dalton has a charity fund. You know, the quarterback, the coach. Mike Brown does not. I didn't didn't find a charity fund for him. That is how sincere he is in his is in his giving. If Mike Brown was my grandfather and I didn't care about football or the Bengals at all, I would probably consider him a good grandfather. He's still not a good owner, but I I don't think he's a bad person at heart. Yeah, I mean you you, other, you could get you could get all your gifts from your other grandfather, right? Yeah, he's like he, he's like the secret Santa who keeps everything a secret. He never gives, you know. He's, 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 yeah, it's, it's, I mean, look, I, I wish him the best, and uh, I I honor the Brown family and the Brown legacy to the moon. But the the there's gonna come a point where I think the Bengals fans are going to have to do what Browns fans are doing, which is, see, the Browns it's fans not going to do more, anything. It's the not, the Browns fans have more, at least they have a sense of humor about losing, you know? Like, you go on Twitter and you make fun of the Bengals, and all these Bengals fans are like, blah, blah, blah. Come on, man. If, if I can't make fun of the uh, Andy Dalton and the Bengals, what else can I do? I think not showing up to games is not going to be effective. No. I don't think it's going to do much. No. Um, I, I think, you know, just... Maybe being more vocal because believe it or not, people are influenced by hearing things. Not being the Bengals. Vocal. No. I, I think so, man. I John? think so because it, it's a trickle up. You know, you keep the the, the, the young guys, the, the players are on Twitter. They're on the, the internet. They read the stuff. They read the Reddit stuff. And then it trickles up to, to Marvin Lewis. But, of course, he's a very stubborn guy. So maybe the assistant coaches at least. And so they start talking about it at dinner. Mike Brown is there. He's like, what are you guys talking about? They're like, oh, we read this. Maybe, maybe. I don't think so. Like, John? The, 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 the bottom line is he's... 84 85 something years old and he likes what he does and this is the only way that he makes money so i don't see anything changing until in one some capacity or other he just is un- incapable of running the franchise yeah, he's already anymore. got his kids in position to succeed him and they're going to you know do the same model you know of operation they, 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 they have a chance to be- evolve further than mike ever could beyond his own capability but yeah basically the status quo will be the status quo mike mike goes back to palestine he was very involved from the beginning and that's true but so, look, here's the thing okay let's just not forget one thing and that's the 2015 season which wasn't which was a disappointment i agree but i mean the fact that the Bengals can be that with a mike brown they that I mean, was a that was the thing. culmination of draft picks and veterans and you know young guys veterans. exactly it was the culmination of their entire process being perfect except for a thumb injury Right. right, right, right. So, I guess that's the only way. That's that's, that's only going to happen once every like fifty. And it hap- yeah, it happened once in in thirteen years. Yeah. So, so we got to wait till uh, twenty. What's twenty eight? Two thousand twenty. Two thousand twenty eight. Start your clocks. As anybody who wants to say you know to take a break from the Bengals, check back in two thousand twenty eight and jump back on the band. And I think we'll have our puppets by then. I think we'll be closer. We're three hundred and one dollars now. I think I could have a puppet by then. Maybe. I think we're. On a, that's the. That's what I'm waiting for. Is the John puppet? That means we've oh, made man. it. I, I want. I want. I want to have John puppet too. I gotta get one for me too. Yeah. He's gonna be such an informative puppet. Oh man. That, yeah. He'll, he'll, he'll be the best one. Oh, well, well, he's going to be the cheapest in terms of because the hair. You can get a discount because the hair. You know. <laughs> 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 
that's true. Alright guys, well, I think uh, we answered the question. Mike Brown is cheap. Yes, he is. And, yes. Um, but that is okay, because, uh, you know, he's a nice guy. Uh, that's all we have for this episode of Sorry if I spit when I speak. We'll catch you next time. So long, guys. Well, I need a dollar.